Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Heart and Stroke Clinical Update. I'd like to uh, thank you for coming, and I'd like to ask you to help me welcome our speaker, Dr. Maria Wolf, on behalf of the uh, Program Planning Committee as well as Heart and Stroke. Uh, Dr. Maria Wolf is a staff endocrinologist at St. Michael's Hospital and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Her clinical and research interests are in medical education and endocrine disorders in pregnancy. She has spoken to local and international audiences in the area of bioethics, women's health, and endocrinology. I know she's recently just returned from Ethiopia doing work there as well. So please help me to give a warm welcome to Dr. Maria Wolf. Thank you so much for the kind welcome and the invitation to be here. You know, I feel, um, I feel rather strange giving this talk after having been in a very underserviced uh, country where none of these drugs were actually, save for two, were available. So just even before we start, I just... I'm so grateful for all that we have here in Canada to be able to serve our patients. And I hope that over this next hour, I can um, help share with you some uh, of the studies and some of the practical guidance to help our patients with diabetes. But I just want to frame it within the context of incredible gratitude for all that we have here, that we are able to uh, in a sense, offer our patients so many options to improve their health. So with that, with that little background, I just want, before I get started, um, you know who I am, and I, I have no uh, biases. Well, of course I've got biases. I have no disclosures <laughs> with regards to any um, uh, companies or products that I'm going to discuss here. But so these are the learning objectives that came forward out of needs assessments and previous feedback. But before I get started, is there something that's really that you've come here for this session wanting to know, just so I can make sure that I address it? So just, I know it's, there's, um, it's a small enough room that if you just yell, hopefully I'll hear it. Anything that's, that these, some of the new agents have been, um, uh, have put in your mind, or how do I use it, or anything burning? Okay, so canagliflozin and amputations. Okay, we'll cover that when we talk about the cannabis trial. Okay. Well, so if hopefully all of these objectives will come uh, out in the next hour. And of course, we have time afterwards. So if you have any questions, and of course, you can email me anytime. Uh, you know, I feel humbled to speak to um, this audience. Could I just get a sense of who are uh, family doctors in the audience? Okay. And nurse practitioners, dietitians, um, diabetes nurses, anyone who I haven't covered? Okay, so I feel very humbled speaking to you because you are the foundation for diabetes care um, and diabetes care in Canada and actually throughout the world. So with regards to how I'm sharing these things about the studies, you've got a lot of practical uh, experience that I would also welcome you sharing. Either I'm happy to be interrupted during my presentation or afterwards. So please don't feel that this is a top-down or, or horizontal discussion. It really is an opportunity to, for you to share some of your experiences as well. Okay, so I don't need to tell anyone in this audience heart and stroke diabetes increases heart and stroke risk. Uh, and it, uh, there's a two to three-fold increased risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke in patients with diabetes. And one of the emerging, although not so emerging now, well-established uh, cardiovascular consequences of diabetes is an increased risk of heart failure and the resultant cause of death. And we can see that the absolute risk of MI, if you have diabetes, essentially is moved forward 15 years. So 15 years earlier, you're going to have your event if you have diabetes. And women have the same 
increased risk and they lose the premenopausal protection that estrogen affords. So both men and women are affected and potentially women even disproportionately. So we're going to start off, this is in a sense a little bit to get these little handheld devices working. So does lowering glucose decrease the risk of microvascular complications? So neuropathy, nephropathy, retinopathy. All right. Wow, these are really long voting times. Maybe we'll shut it down. This is a very advanced audience. They vote quickly. So, <laughs> well, um, I don't want to give away the answer without seeing yours. Yes. Okay. So this is something. So really, our A1C targets have been determined by studies that were looking at microvascular disease. So when you look at glycemic lowering trials. Um, including the DCCT with type 1 diabetes, UKPDS with type 2 diabetes. It was very clear um, across type 1 and type 2 that lowering glucose, reducing the A1C, reduces microvascular events. Progression of retinopathy, progression of nephropathy, development of neuropathy, and progression. So there, you know, it's, if you think about it and when you're talking to your patient, a 1% reduction in A1C ends up being about a 40% decrease in microvascular complications. So that's where our A1C targets have come from. But I've just finished telling you that the majority of patients die, majority of patients with diabetes die due to cardiovascular disease. So does lowering glucose decrease the risk of Macrovascular disease. Yes, thank you. Our, our ticker has started sooner. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, so we've got. Ooh, uh, there we go. So we've got some yes, some no, and some maybe. So this isn't as overwhelming a response like for microvascular disease. And when we look at macrovascular complications, many of these trials are contaminated by because these weren't primary outcomes. Or if they were, they were in a population with very early onset of diabetes. But if you scroll along the bottom uh, row there, you'll see that generally at initially, the trials did not show an improvement in macrovascular outcomes, but the 10-year follow-ups often did. So both the DCCT and the UKPDS, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, had 10-year follow-up studies, and in those studies, better glycemic control did impact macrovascular disease. But I think one thing, and so a me every time there's a bit of confusion, we get a meta-analysis, right? So a meta-analysis was done and showing that for a major cardiovascular event, there was a decrease and for myocardial infarction, there was a decrease, but not for stroke and heart failure. And then pulling the population out a little bit more, it was clear that if the glucose lowering intervention was initiated before the development of macrovascular disease, and microvascular disease, then the impact was significant. So I think the take-home message is here. Often we think, well, you know, you've just got a touch of, touch of sugar, touch of diabetes, we'll just sort of watch things, but then, you know, 15 years later, now we've got to start thinking of cardiovascular disease. No, the very opposite is true. It's getting the glucose down early has an impact. Once somebody already has macrovascular disease, probably doesn't have as much of an impact. And that has to do with the effects of glucose and M products on the vasculature, okay? So I think the bottom line is intervening early. So what happens when the medication that we give to lower glucose actually uh, causes cardiovascular events? So this was the situation with rosiglitazone where in 2007, uh, Nissen showed that post-marketing surveillance data had an increased risk of myocardial infarction. 
Okay, you don't want to lower the glucose and then kill the patient. So as a result, the FDA has required in 2008 that every new glucose lowering agent, including insulin, so all of the new insulins that are coming out are subject to the same requirement for approval in uh, the US and therefore around the world um, to have a cardiovascular endpoint study. So much of what I'm going to be discussing in the next uh, 48 minutes is the, those outcome studies. So these outcome studies were a direct result of FDA requirements. They're not sort of a, oh, let's see what, you know, maybe there was some, uh, oh, let's see what happens, but these are absolutely mandated for marketing. So that's why we're seeing all this, and that's why now we have some opportunities to get more data on cardiovascular endpoints in these agents. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to follow a patient over the next 40 minutes. So he's 30, is 40, no, 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 59, and he's self-employed, i.e. no drug plan. Um, and his A1C is 6.3%. You do an oral glucose tolerance test, and it's consistent with... impaired glucose tolerance, impaired fasting glucose, pre-diabetes, right? So, so he's got all three. He's got an elevated fasting glucose, an A1C that's above um, six, and an elevated two-hour test. So what is, his, uh, <laughs> what is his risk of progressing to diabetes in the next five years? Okay, three, two, one, blast off. So I wish, <laughs> so I think we sometimes underestimate the impact of prediabetes and its progression. So when looking at studies that looked at impaired glucose tolerance, the DPP study, it was about four to five percent per year. But if you have multiple factors, then the risk of progression increases significantly. And in the context of impaired fasting glucose and uh, increased A1C, the risk is 100%. Albeit this was in a small follow-up group in Japan. But what I'm trying to impart here is that prediabetes progresses and it's important to intervene. So what would you do next? Two, one. Okay, so reassess with labs. Yay! Refer to the local deck. No refer to endocrinology. Um, okay, so let's talk about referring to local diabetes education. So one of the challenges is the government has mandated diabetes education centers and they are not being used and they are at risk for losing their funding because they're not getting referrals. So I'm really heartened to see that 60% of you would refer. I'd love to see 100% of you to refer because what is the main intervention in this setting is prevention and so much of it is lifestyle. And so the opportunity for your patient, I doubt that any of you have the time to, spend, to do a proper assessment of somebody's diet to look at some of the behavioral change factors that are impacting their inability to make those changes and help encourage them and see them regularly for follow-up. And these DECs, actually the new uh, nomenclature is Diabetes Education Program, not DEC, it's DEP, so forgive my old nomenclature. But this, 100% of patients with prediabetes and diabetes have coverage for this. They have, to, they have an opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one with nurses and dietitians to go for classes, to have the support. They can even go there every week if they need to. This is a tremendous resource, so please refer, or we're going to lose the funding for them if they're not utilized. And most of them are sitting absolutely idle, like they're seeing people within a day or two. Um, so 
with regards to whether or not any medication would be appropriate. So the two medications that we, that we have that have been shown to reduce progression from prediabetes to diabetes are metformin and any other agents that's, that's been studied or shown? Pardon? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. That lifestyle is 100%. So this lifestyle, you can see here that lifestyle changes decrease the risk of progression by almost 60%. That's fantastic. What does lifestyle mean? What does this lifestyle mean in the DPP trial? Pardon? Exercise and diet. And what kind of exercise and what kind of diet? Thirty minutes per day, five days per week. Okay, fantastic. So this is why you need a diabetes education program because in the DPP, the um, active lifestyle group met every week for the first six weeks, and then every two weeks, and then every month. And if they didn't meet in person, they got a phone call from sort of a motivational coach to help them get that heart rate raising exercise. So it was 60, per, 60 to 80% maximum heart rate for 30 minutes, five times per week. How many people here are getting that? I'm putting my arm up as an example of how to put your arm up, not as an example of doing it. <laughs> Although I've just come back from hiking at 4,200 meters. So I figured that's good. That's good for my heart, at least for a while. My oxygen carrying capacity is higher. But so this is really tough to do. And this is where the evidence is. There was also a very, a, they met with a dietitian regularly and had phone calls and food records from a dietitian at least every two weeks. So what I'm not trying to make this sound overwhelming, but if you're going to want these results, you need to have a dedicated now, obviously, this was a study group. They self-identified as motivated, but you needed to have a deck supporting you so that you can get that kind of support. So 100% number one um, diet exercise. Really simple. The first thing, cut out sugar and flour. You know, that's a bit of a no-brainer, but it's very simple for people to understand. Um, you have to specify that bread is made of flour and so is pasta. <laughs> So no bread, no flour, no white rice. Um, and then you're basically caught most of your troublemakers out. And then after that, um, you can start making the, the difference. So metformin decreased the risk by 31%, more so in people that were younger and more so in people that were overweight. So that was the group that tended to benefit most. Okay, um, any other agent that's been shown to decrease progression? One I'm sure you use all the time. No. Um, oops, wrong slide. OK, um, hold that thought. So for each of the agents today, um, as we discuss them, we're going to talk about their cardiovascular risk or benefit. Right? We're at heart and stroke, so I think that's got to be our theme. And then some of the patient counseling characteristics. And then I'll get back to the second agent. OK. So um, the, because there's only been one placebo-controlled randomized trial, which was the UKPDS, in a subgroup of obese individuals, 600 obese individuals were randomized to metformin or not, and that's that, um, this blue guy here, which showed significance for metformin, significant benefit for metformin. The other ones are um, not placebo controlled or they're observational, so they've got a lot more contamination. But in general, uh, metformin is, if not neutral, beneficial. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why. There's a lot of in vitro studies on endothelium and, and metformin, but you can't extrapolate because rosiglitazone showed a lot of endothelial benefit and then resulted in cardiovascular death. So, um, but this was grandfathered and approved before 2008, so we're never going to get a cardiovascular endpoint study. So this is as good as it gets. So any counseling things that you tell people with metformin? Yes. So the primary one is GI upset. So don't move quickly. 
Um, the pills here are, are breakable. In Ethiopia, they weren't. <laughs> so little things that you learn. But, um, you know, start at 250 BID and then move up. If it's slowly titrated, about 98% of people will tolerate it. If it's rapidly titrated, so um, instead of looking at 500 BID for three days, then one gram BID, um, it, uh, there was about a tw 17 to 18% um, inability to tolerate. So just take it slowly. Hopefully they're working with their DEP at the same time. And uh, so dose reduction with renal impairment, which we'll talk about later. And how many of you screen for B12 with metformin? Yeah, so the data suggests that it's probably at less than 10% of people will develop a B12 deficiency. So there are no recommendations to screen or not to screen, but if somebody has other factors that might impact them, um, it's worthwhile checking. Okay, so with everything, and this is where the humbling part is, because metformin is so expensive in Ethiopia. It's, it's first line, it's supposed to be first line, but it's about a week's salary to pay for one gram BID of a government worker. So here, thankfully, metformin is still cheap and relatively so we're looking at about seven dollars per month ten times more expensive is the sustained release um, version which if somebody is not able to tolerate the oral medication or if their adherence to a BID medication is going to be poor and they have coverage um, then that would be a useful uh, um, option how many of you use the sustained release one regularly Okay, for the side effects and ease of dosing, yeah, it's at 10 times the cost. Okay, oh, well, this was the answer to the second question. What other agents have been shown to decrease the progression from prediabetes to diabetes? How many of you have written a prescription for an alpha-glucosidase inhibitor in the last year? Here I'm actually using my arm because uh, I, I do use this medication, um, quite regularly. Why don't you use it? GI distress? Any other? Sometimes people say lack of efficacy. So let's talk about it. So um, this was the STOP NIDIM trial. It was coordinated through um, Université de Laval and through St. Michael's. So it always gets mentioned in my division, but um, so acarbose decreased the progression from impaired glucose tolerance, the same group as in the DPP trial, by 25%. And um, just in September in Lisbon um, at the EASD, a study looking at um, a Chinese, predominantly male Chinese population post ACS that had impaired glucose tolerance were randomized to the addition of acarbose versus not. And um, we'll come back to it when we talk about cardiovascular endpoints. But again, there was about a 20, 18% reduction in the progression of to type, sorry, type 2 diabetes. So previous meta-analyses had shown a benefit in primarily in the IGT population to metformin decreasing the risk of myocardial infarction. Why do you think that might be the case? Like what would be the physiological mechanism for? So remember, these medications, they do not prevent, but they delay the absorption of disaccharides. So you absorb the disaccharide, you don't absorb it, uh, so you ingest the disaccharide, you don't absorb it in your duodenum, so therefore it arrives at your ileum, um, the ileum actually has disaccharidases, but they need to be upregulated. So the, the moral of this story is you have to titrate slowly to upregulate these, because otherwise the colon gets all the disaccharidases, the disaccharides, and what happens there? A fermentation feast. So um, that's often the reason people give for not starting these medications. But if you give the disaccharidases in the ileum an opportunity to upregulate, uh, then it's actually very well tolerated, and it's tolerated with the same efficacy as metformin when it's titrated appropriately. So anyway, bottom line is it looked, this looked good. 
So that same trial that was reported in September of this year at EISD um, called the ACE trial, again, it was Chinese, predominantly male Chinese patients with um, ACS and IGT. You can see that there was no difference in cardiovascular, uh, in MACE outcomes, five-point MACE outcomes. So um, we're not going to use these agents primarily for cardiovascular benefits at least in this population. So as I mentioned, the main barrier tends to be GI upset, but if you titrate very slowly, it's actually well tolerated. Um, but, and it tends to run about uh, three times more expensive than, three to four times more expensive than metformin, and you need a limited use code for its use. So who is it beneficial for? because it's, it's basically like lowering the glycemic index of what you eat, right? So, um, you know, you're telling people no sugar nor flour, but, you know, say they're, I, I tell my Italian patients once a week you can have pasta and it's only half a cup, but um, it, so in those individuals for lowering postprandial sugars, it can be quite effective. But overall, whereas metformin gives you a 1 to 1.5% 1 decrease in A1C, what's the A1C lowering of acarbose even at full dose? What was that? I think someone said something, but I missed it. If you said half, you're right. So it's about 50, per, uh, not 50, per, half. It's about half as effective as uh, metformin or less. Okay, so he was 63, he had prediabetes. We sent him to the deck. We also started metformin. He's gained five pounds because um, he's widowed and now he's eating out more. And now his A1C is Three, two, one. Okay. So now, unfortunately, I think, and perhaps we could have done the technology. I just returned from Ethiopia, so I didn't have a chance to talk to our VA team because ideally we could mention more than one of these. So apologies if that frustrated you today, but I'm hoping that 100% of you would have wanted to pick one. Is that right? Yes? Okay, good. Because this is the person, he's gained weight. We need to re-look at the lifestyle changes. Please don't ever forget about that. And I, I'm sure you don't. Um, you're on the ground with these patients. But getting him back to the Diabetes Education Center is t absolutely important. So now, huh, interesting. Okay, so the majority have said uh, citagliptin and... A uh, few after that was the SGLT2s, and then after that was the um, secretagogues. All right. So what made you decide? So weight. So you wanted something neutral or uh, weight reducing? Cost. Okay, he's 63. He does not have coverage yet. And right now, his main concern is cost. So let's talk about what goes into the discussion of what the what next after metformin. So um, you're all familiar with this algorithm, but generally metformin is the foundation on which we build any further agents. So if the algorithm in a sense that you can think about is if they have already cardiovascular disease, Let's use something that has a cardiovascular benefit because those are the people that were included in the trial. If they don't have cardiovascular disease, then we don't know if they have the same benefit as in the trials because they weren't included. Therefore, let's look at all of the factors, like how, bad's the, how high is the A1C? How potent an agent do you need to lower it? 
um, hypoglycemia, weight gain, cardiovascular disease, renal impairment, heart failure, and access to treatment. So I've just spent the month where everything we wanted to do had a barrier of cost. So an A1C is a half month salary. So everybody that came in to our diabetes clinic in Ethiopia had a random glucose done right before their visit. So we, um, uh, cost is a huge issue. And one of the reasons that we think about, um, so if we look at cost, we can see that the very cheapest medications after metformin are the secretagogues. And so that's what everybody uses in Ethiopia, but that's often what we would use here next if that was the only factor. The negatives are weight gain and hypoglycemia and potential wearing out of the beta cells. Um, that's so insulin secretagogues, again, were approved before 2008, so we don't have cardiovascular endpoint trials. But we can see here that overall mortality and stroke risk in patients who are on these agents based on large databases, so these are not randomized control studies, appear to be significantly higher. So there are sulfonylurea receptors in the heart, and um, there is a decrease in ischemic preconditioning in people who are on these agents, especially gliburide, because it interacts with the sulfonylurea receptors in the heart. Glycoside does not. So, and most of these studies were using gliburide. So, you know, the big things are hypoglycemia risk, um, especially with gliburide, because its metabolites also act on the sulfonylurea receptors, weight gain on average about three to five kilos and um, the need for dose reduction with renal impairment. So you can see that these are really the cheapest medications and that's why they tended to be used the most. Um, but because of the negatives and because of the funding for other ones, I think that's shifting. But you can see Glyburide is the one with the most weight gain and the most hypoglycemia. Its A1C lowering is about 1.5% because it's the most potent of these, versus glycoside is about 1%, and the rest are about 0.75% at their highest dose. But even um, glycoside MR is still running a very low cost. So this is why I'm including this, because cost is an issue for some of our patients, and especially when we talk about some of the other more expensive agents, just because somebody has, you know, we often ask, do you have a drug plan? Great, let me write you this designer drug. But what percentage is the copay? So if a drug is $300 a month, and they have a 20%, 80% coverage, or 70% coverage, that plus copay can end up being quite expensive. And now a lot of the drug plans are not including the pharmacy fee. So $300 a month, they've got to pay, oh my math, let's say $60 because they're getting 80% coverage plus they have to pay the 15 of the dispensing fee. That can add up in a hurry. So unless you work for the government, <laughs> or you're a teacher. I think they're the only ones that get 100%. So um, anyway, so as a result, he has made the choice after your discussion with him that because he does not have a drug plan that he would go on glycoside. But now we're six years later and he's just been diagnosed with coronary artery disease and heart failure. His A1C has climbed again. What do we do next? Okay, I'm just realizing if, if you all can't see, it's okay if you wanted to move. No, you're good? Okay, or else you can come sit up here because I can see really nicely on this screen, so <laughs> if that's easier. Um, so when we're looking at, again, I'm sure 100% would have said refer to DEC if you'd had the option for multiple votes, correct? Okay, so then um, SGLT2 inhibitors have come up on top. 
with um, some DPV-4 and liraglutide. Okay, good. So let's talk about the SGLT2s because that was the that got the top vote. So I don't need to belabor you. You know how they work. Um, SGLT2 is responsible for 90% of glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule. So if you block it, again, it's not a full block, but you block about 40 to 50% of the reabsorption in the tubule. Therefore, the glucose is going out into the urine. So, um, and there are SGLT2 and SGLT1 co-inhibitors, but they've not been marketed in Canada and they've only been studied in type 1 diabetes. So, this is a bit of old news now, two years, but presented at the ADA in June 2015. But this was the first time that an agent had not only shown a decrease in MACE, so a decrease in cardiovascular endpoints and death, and death from any cause, but this was the first time that heart decrease in heart failure hospitalizations. So what I'm telling the residents is about 15% decrease in MACE and about 35% decrease in um, CHF hospitalizations. So this was a bit game-changing with regards to two years ago, with regards to, again, in empiric outcomes, all of the people had known cardiovascular disease. So this was not, this was a secondary prevention trial. And of course, when you're designing a trial that needs to look at cardiovascular endpoints, you want to get as much, as many events as possible. So you're going to pick the highest risk population. So um, I think was already mentioned, the second agent that's often used is canagliflozin, and this was the first one to go on the ODB formulary. So it was the one that was actually prescribed the most uh, in Ontario the last two years because of its formulary availability as the first, first one off the block. So again, you're seeing about a 15% decrease in MACE, um, uh, cardiovascular events, and you're seeing a about a 35% decrease in heart failure, which isn't highlighted, I'm not sure why, but it's right here. And as well, it was well adjudicated renal outcomes that also showed an improvement. So they did not show death from any cause, which had been shown in um, empiric outcomes. So again, you've got great evidence for this. Now, why is it that these agents have an impact on cardiovascular outcomes and heart failure. So there is an osmotic effect that um, is is present, which leads to about a two uh, millimol, no, not millimol, millimeter of mercury reduction in blood pressure. Um, also results in a slight increase in heart rate, but that hasn't been necessarily significant in all trials. So there's a lot of speculation. There's changes in glucagon. There's increase in fatty acid, um, free fatty acid production. And guess what the heart likes as its primary juice? is free fatty acids. So you're potentially giving the heart what it likes uh, most for its metabolism. So these are all speculations. There hasn't been, you know, you, you can't necessarily dissect it. And as we've learned, in vitro studies don't necessarily lead to what is, le what is causing the outcomes. But, you know, with two agents showing benefit, this is probably a consistent thing. But as was mentioned by our colleagues, this is really the death toll for canagliflozin. And um, this significant, so the reason why amputations were an adjudicated endpoint is in the phase two and f initial phase three study, there was a signal for increased lower extremity amputations. So it was because of that, that um, it had to be an adjudicated outcome. It was not found in the phase two trials of empagliflozin, which is why it was not an adjudicated outcome. So there's been a flurry of the empiric outcomes authors are saying, well, it's the same thing, but it's not really. When you've got an adjudicated outcome versus not. But right now, we've got an adjudicated outcome that shows increase in amputations and, interestingly, an increase in non 
uh, in traumatic fractures, non-fragility fractures. And again, that was a signal that was seen with canagliflozin in the phase two trials. And that's why fracture was adjudicated versus an empiric outcomes fractures were not adjudicated. So how, what do you conclude from this? Is it a class effect? Is it a difference? Because there is a little slight difference in their ratios of impacting SGLT2. Some Canna has a slight SGLT1 effect, but it's really, really subtle. So how many think this is a class effect? How many think that this is a Canna Lefloson specific effect? How many don't know? <laughs> How many want another trial? So what's our third uh, gliflozin? Is DAPA gliflozin. And so we will um, get that data. Completion date is in a year and a half. And then it'll probably be reported either at one of the fall meetings or in the next year at the ADA. But, you know, my colleague who is on this, the, the safety board for this, study has said that they have not stopped it. So there's no signal. That's, it's not secret. They actually have to publish these things for shareholders in the U.S. So um, shareholders need to know first whether a drug is safe, not patients, but shareholders, because they need to be able to sell low, sell high, buy low, something like that. Um, so we'll, this will hopefully provide some additional benefit. So uh, uh, some additional knowledge to see, is this a class effect or not? So right now, the European um, EPA, Euro European Protection Association, which deals with drugs, has said this is a class effect. So they put a warning on all SGLT2 inhibitors that there can be an increased risk of fracture and amputation. The FDA and Health Canada has said this is a CAN effect, so it's only the warning is only on um, canagliflozin. Um, to be honest, given that potential risk, um, how many of you are continuing canna? Yeah, it's, you know, obviously if somebody's at higher risk, if they've got peripheral vascular disease, if they've got neuropathy, it would be an absolute no, but we don't know. Um, I think from seeing what my colleagues are doing, Everyone's just moving to EMPA. And again, I have no disclosures. I'm not promoting one over the other. But I think the evidence, um, and in fact, um, it appears that the company that owns Canna is getting out of diabetes. It's probably too high a legal risk. So if, you don't, if you're not changing now, you probably will have to in the next month because it won't be available. So what else do you tell your patients if you're starting on SGLT2? Genital infections, UTIs. Oh, I love pouncing on residents that say UTIs. So anything else? I'm not pouncing on anybody here. <laughs> anything else? Pardon? Yeah, so an additional void. Anything else? Okay, so. It's actually, if you look at the urinary tract infections, there's no difference placebo versus SGLT2. So you don't have to, the one last thing to talk about, you don't have to have to counsel about UTIs because there's no difference, either in canvas or in empiric outcomes. Um, but genital infections, generally you want to counsel people 5% for men, uh, less if they're not circumcised, but I think you can just say 5%, 10% for if they're female. So it's important to give that context. Um, to patients to know that it's not 100%. But if you've already had an infection, um, or if you're prone to it, pe women with diabetes are, especially if they've got poor glycemic control, then maybe try to get the glucose a little bit better before you start it and warn them about you know, genital hygiene. And generally in the trials, people got treated with over-the-counter therapy and were able to continue. So it's not an indication to stop. Frequent infections probably are, because that's somebody who's more susceptible. I've had some patients that really lost weight on it and really had improvements, and so they're using vaginal probiotics and 
yogurts and all sorts of other things um, to help control the yeast infection because they really want to stay on the medication. So it sort of depends on how you work. Um, one extra void per day, let's hope for our male patients it's not during the night, <laughs> but um, sometimes it is, and that has to be discussed as well. Weight loss, um, generally about, are you all seeing weight loss in your patients on these agents? Generally, it's about, in the studies, it was about three kilograms, um, which is significant. One thing that absolutely needs to be warned about is euglycemic DKA, and it's actually not DKA. I mean, it's not euglycemic, but they'll come in with DKA at around, uh, you know, 10 to, 15, 10 to 15 millimoles per liter. So they're not super hyperglycemic. How many of you had any, have had patients with this? Okay. How many of you are doing urinalyses on your patients with the um, urine ACR? Do you, don't, you don't need to. I'm not pr pr um, or promoting it. But I've noticed that a lot of patients, when they get their urinalysis, are also, when they get their urine ACR, are also getting a urinalysis, which may be helpful if you've got a reproductive age woman, you want to make sure you've told her not to do the ACR on her period, but she does, and you'll see blood. But um, I'm getting a lot of faxes from family doctors circling the urinalysis, and they got ketones. They're going to have ketones. So this is a function of this medication. You will get ketones. Because um, these medications, often you need to decrease the insulin dose when you start them. Um, if they're on, because remember, in empiric outcomes, uh, over 60% of patients were on insulin. Okay, so they're high risk. They were on insulin in multiple agents. You decrease renal clearance of ketone bodies, and you increase glucagon secretion, which increases um, the production of free fatty acids and ketones. So um, almost 100% of people are going to have ketones in their urine. The problem is, so, you know, I just, I had this awkward situation where one of the residents, and I can mention this because I don't think any of you are going to know who this is in Ethiopia that I was working with, said, I got diagnosed with diabetes, and um, I don't believe the A1C because a lot of the labs you can't, a lot of the labs are in Addis were a bit fly-by-night, and so you'd get these really weird readings, and you not sure what reagents they're using, expired. Anyway, so her A1C was 10, um, and she didn't believe it. And so she'd gone to some uh, private doctor. It's very hard to get, but DAPA is available, and it's extremely expensive. It's like a month's salary in Ethiopia. But she started DAPA with nothing else and severe hypoglycemia. And we went away to La Labella, which is a beautiful part in the north. And when I came back on Monday, she was in the ICU in DKA. And I was like, okay, team, why did this happen? You know, not that you want to turn a colleague's tragedy into a teaching moment. She was so hyperglycemic that with, you know, with an A1C of 10, her average sugar was running at, you know, the little times 2 minus 4. That's a sort of a rough way to figure out an average sugar from an A1C. So 10 times 2 is 20 minus 4 is 16. So her average sugar was running around 16, which... After you hit over about 13, you actually develop what's called um, glucotoxicity. It actually prevents the exocytosis of pre-stored insulin. Again, you don't have to fill your mind with all this, but essentially, she was insulin deplete because of her hyperglycemia. It's an ironic thing that her hyperglycemia shut down her endogenous insulin production. Then you add an agent that is decreasing um, her insulin, she already probably was insulin deficient, and anyway, it was dreadful, and then everything went wrong, because there's just things, anyway, everything went wrong. She was in the ICU for two weeks, intubated. It was dreadful, but I'm only giving you that image that you really have to warn your patients, and if they're very hyperglycemic, do not start this agent first. Get their numbers down, even if you have to put them on insulin for like a few weeks, or a few days just to get their glucose lower, or um, have them really stay well hydrated. And if there are any sign of nausea, or um, um, then have them stop the drug. So this is, you know, the sad man's 
Are you familiar with the sad man's, the medications that people have to stop if they're dehydrated? You absolutely, if people are not, um, if they're dehydrated, if they're sick, they have to stop these agents. So, you know, we've had a rash of people before I left at St. Mike's ICU that were patients with type 2 diabetes that presented with DKA. You know, they got a pneumonia that sent them over, their glucose went high, uh, became more insulin resistance from the pneumonia, and they ended up in DKA. So I'm glad to see that very few of your patients have, but um, please warn them when you're starting these medications. So these drugs, so Invocana was first, um, uh, canagliflozin was first in, and so it was the cheapest. EMPA is the most expensive. Um, they're running around $3 a day. So remember, if your patients have... Uh, you know, a 70% drug plan, they're still going to be paying $30 plus dispensing fees for a month for these agents. So um, the next group of agents that um, was voted on was the SGLT, no, the GLP-1 inhibitors. And I understand there's a sponsored symposium afterwards on these agents. So um, the GLP-1, uh, GLP-1, if any of you have had any carbohydrates this morning, you've activated your GLP-1. As soon as you uh, consume a carbohydrate within your mouth, the G cells of your stomach produce GLP-1, and it does all sorts of good things. It decreases, uh, decreases your appetite, increases satiety, slows your gut transport, augments insulin secretion, shuts down glucagon secretion, changes renal and cardiac blood flow, all good. Except, what's that? Oh, oh, it was someone answering their cell phone. Okay, um, except um, what's its half-life? What's that? So 90 seconds because it's degraded by DPP-4. Okay, so if you want to make it last longer, you either have to partially block, so basically block by about 50% your DPP-4 with oral agents, or you modify the molecule so that the endogenous DPP-4 can't use it. So this is the next group of agents. So the GLP-1 receptor agonists, because they are proteins, have to be injected. They are by injection only. And so liraglutide, which is marketed as Victoza in Canada, showed a decrease in MACE outcomes um, by about 12 to 13% which is a number needed to treat of around 50. So decreased MACE outcomes. There was no decrease in heart failure hospitalizations. Okay, so emperig outcomes, MACE plus heart failure hospitalizations, these medications, so liraglutide, only cardiovascular events. So that was two years ago. Then semaglutide, which is not marketed in Canada, but is very similar to liraglutide. Again, a modification of endogenous GLP-1 to make it more difficult for DPP-4 to degrade it. it showed an even more dramatic um, decrease in cardiovascular events. It also showed a decrease in A1C. So for all of these trials, there was meant to be glycemic equipose, meaning these were not designed for glucose lowering, and therefore so that the impact would be the drug, not the glucose lowering. Um, but were there any concerns with the SUSTAIN-6 trial in the semaglutide group? Increased progression of retinopathy. So the FDA has approved semaglutide in the U.S. saying that that impact was due to gly improved glycemic control. So in the UK, uh, sorry, in the DCCT trial, which was using intensive insulin for type 1 diabetes, initially there was an increase in retinopathy with intensive glycemic control. So that's sort of been excused as an effect of the improved glycemic control, even though the goal of the study was to have glycemic equipose. So this is just something to, to think about. It's not available in Canada right now, but... Um, they have asked for post-marketing surveillance, so we might get more of that information. Exenatide, again, this was presented uh, in Lisbon this September. 
Exenatide is marketed as Bieda. Uh, it is available in Canada, but it's not marketed in a sense, so you probably haven't heard about it, or have you? Um, or if you've heard about it, it's, it's not something, I've never seen anybody come with it, um, unless they've gotten it from the States. And so disappointingly for them, Exenatide was cardiovascularly neutral. So just as a, and then Lixizenatide, which is a, also a modified GLP-1 receptor agonist, was also cardiovascular neutral. So we've got loraglutide and semaglutide that showed cardiovascular benefits, but no change in heart failure outcomes. And then you've got exenatide and lixazenatide, which were cardiovascularly neutral. Okay. So when you cancel these patients, the main side effect, because of the decreased gastric emptying, is nausea. They do result in a weight loss, generally about five. Uh, four to five kilograms, and liraglutide is marketed as a weight loss drug, Saxenda, um, and because of an increased risk in laboratory animals, specifically in mice and rats of medullary thyroid cancers, it's contraindicated if there's a history of that. Um, that's not been shown in any of the, it's actually been adjudicated in all of the um, cardiovascular endpoint studies, and there's been no signal. Um, so this is the main problem. These are not covered by ODB, nor do I su suspect that they will be for a while because they're not providing an addition other than weight loss, an additional advantage over the SGLT2s, and they're expensive. So I mentioned that this is available but not marketed in Canada. You're generally looking at a full dose of about, with these, about $10 a day once you put markup in and um, dispensing fees. So remember, unless you've got a 100% drug plan, that is a significant um, financial impact on your patients with um, not a significant cardiovascular benefit over the SGLT2s, which are about a third the price. But um, their main... The main reason why you'll have people, has anybody come in to your offices asking for these medications? Yeah. Yeah. We're tending to be contaminated by uh, direct to consumer advertising. And what are they asking for it for? Weight loss. Yeah. So, what's another way that they can lose weight? Referral to DEC. <laughs> Right, because these medications, are you going to, when, when all of these studies have been looked at, and especially the three milligram dose, um, which is marketed as, as Sexenda, um, as soon as you stop the medication, you go right back to baseline. So are you then, um, and this was in a trial where you were well supported with dietitians, nurses, so um, you're thinking, well, let's just do a short-term thing. I've seen many patients do it as a short-term, and then as soon as they stop it because they can't afford it, they gain the weight back. Is that your experience as well, if any of you have been using it? So you really have to think of long-term costs when you initiate these type of agents because, um, you know, sometimes you think, well, I'll just give you a kick start for your weight loss, and then once you get all the lifestyle changes, but in the trials, people gained right back. So... Anyway, I'm, you'll hear more about it at lunch if you choose through a sponsored um, presentation. Okay, so the DPP-4 inhibitors were the second, the third choice for people. And all of the cardio, again, all of these have been subject to cardiovascular endpoint trials and they were cardiovascular neutral. So there was no uh, harm but no benefit. The problem was in Saver Timmy, there was an increased risk of heart failure hospitalizations. So, um, when we can see here, there was a 27% increase with saxagliptin with cardiovascular events. So, essentially, you know, whenever there is heterogeneity, then you do a meta analysis, and you can see that Saver had the greatest um, allogliptin, a little bit less. Allogliptin is not marketed in Canada, than citagliptin. And then when they looked at all of them, it was just um, not significant. So is this a class effect? Is this a saxagliptin effect? What do you think? Class effect? Yes. 
Saxic Lipton effect. I'm not voting because I'm too hungry waiting for lunch. It's way better to present before lunch than after lunch. Because after lunch, the poor speaker has to really keep you awake. But so we don't know. There is going to be the Linux Lipton is going to have uh, is going to be finished in a year, probably presented at the ADA in June of 2019. So when we're looking at patient counseling, these are weight neutral. Um, pancreatitis has been. Um, there are numerically increased rates of pancreatitis, although they haven't been statistically significant in these endpoint trials. So if they have a history of pancreatitis or if they develop it, it needs to be discontinued. Pancreatic cancer is also something that's been monitoring. There is no increased numbers, but um, patients with diabetes in general are at increased risk for pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer. So uh, because there's been pancreatic signals, um, these need to be reported. Joint pain has been reported. So we've been talking about the impact, A1C lowering impact. So the SGLT2 inhibitors, A1C lowering is how much? Yeah, 1 to 1.5. The folks that lose weight really um, tend to be closer to the 1.5. The um, GLP-1 receptor agonists, they're effective drugs, they're about 1.5%, but it's at a very high monetary cost. Um, these medications, are they more potent than the SGLT2, uh, than the, yes, SGLT2 inhibitors, or less? Who says more? Who says less? You have to vote or else I won't let you go for lunch. No, okay. Um, yeah, so these are pretty weak agents. They really tend to be the second line now, but they're really weak. Like, you're probably getting a 0.5% bang for your buck. I mean, 0.5% A1C lowering. So, um, and they're not providing any weight benefit. So, probably, um, and anyway, we've got to put that into context. And they cost about the same as the SGLT2 inhibitors. So, they're running about 2 to $3 a day and they are all covered by ODB. So, and they come in combination tablets as well that can be helpful for some patients. Okay, so because he has a history of coronary artery disease and heart failure, um, the majority of you wanted to start an SGLT2 inhibitor, so that's what we did. But now his GFR has dropped. Oops, that should say EMPA. And, of course, you should be able to vote for more than one. Ah. So maybe this vote will not be very valid. Just pick whichever one, and then we'll talk about it. Two, one. Okay, so metformin often comes out front and center, but actually all of these need adjustment. So if you're going to look at any... Um, ooh. So this is my favorite graph. I have this always for the residents to look at because um, this is from the CDA. If you just do CDA, renal dose adjustment, it'll come up. And I'll just sort of tell you. So at 42, a GFR of 42, you can see. So metformin, between 30 to 60, it's one gram per day. Over 60, it's two grams, less than 30 not to use it. The um, secretagogues, generally less than 30 for glycoside. Um, and then the... SGLT2 inhibitors, definitely not less than 45. With EMPA, you can start it at less than 60, but this is sort of a gray zone. It's much less effective if your A1C, if your GFR is less than 60. Okay, so as a result, oops, he now has to, ah, okay. Okay, so I'll tell you what to do and then you can vote. So you had to lower his doses for renal adjustment and now his A1C went to 8.2%. So now what would you like to do? You had to stop the amphloglifosin, you reduce the metformin to only 500 BID, you stop the, um, you reduce the glycoside MR. Great. So 
100% would have voted for one if you could have. It's good not to refer to endocrinologist because um, you all picked the right thing to do, uh, which is look at starting basal insulin. So which oral agents should be discontinued with basal insulin? Three, two, one. Okay. So interestingly, so act so um, the thiazolidine diones, yes. Um, so very few people are going to be on them, but the most people said secretagogues. So you can actually continue with basal insulin. You can continue the secretagogue. You'd sort of be thinking, well, why would you consider this? Why would you continue? Sometimes because. If you think that they still have any beta cell function, uh, often you're starting this when the A1C is quite high and you're only starting a dose of 10 units. You can continue the secretagogue, uh, but it is off label. But you can also stop it because the basal insulin is going to be doing the same thing. Metformin is actually off label use, but we use it in everybody with insulin as long as they've got good renal function because it decreases weight gain and decreases the units of insulin that are required. Um, linagliptin, for some reason, is not approved, um, but the rest are. Um, thiazolidine dions are actually approved with basal insulin, but they should never be used with insulin because it increases the risk of heart failure. In fact, these agents should not be used, period. So if oral agents, what oral medication should be discontinued with mixed insulin? You don't have to vote for thiazolidine dions because we already have said that they're not approved. Okay, so absolutely, this is where the secretagogues should not be used at all if you're using mixed insulin because of the risk of hypoglycemia. But actually, with a basal insulin, they don't seem to have as much of a risk of um, hypoglycemia. So again... Um, metformin is off-label, um, secretagogues should be discontinued, acarbose can be continued, um, linagliptin is not approved, and liraglutide is not approved with mixed insulin either. So, hmm. okay, so I've, I've gone a little bit over because we've had a little bit of an interactivity, but I think what we've talked about today is, uh, number one, identifying the patient factors that lead to the choice of agents. So if they've got cardiovascular disease, you want to pick something that has got proven cardiovascular endpoints. And again, if you're going to have the choice, you'd probably pick one that showed benefit for not just MACE, but also heart failure hospitalizations. Okay, And, and that is covered um, by OTB or at least cheaper. Uh, otherwise, don't forget about cost because that tends to obviously it's forefront on my in my mind after being in Ethiopia. But our patients also have to bear the cost, and the majority of them bear it through private coverage. Um, think about all of these factors: the cost, the weight neutrality, the risk of hypoglycemia, and cardiovascular endpoint trials. And then lastly, always think about renal impairment because the many medications have to be reduced or discontinued in the context of renal impairment. Okay, so please let me know if you have, I know we uh, have about 15 minutes for any questions. And as I said, I'm happy to hear also your experiences because you've also had uh, experience with these medications and things that have worked and things that have not if you can share them with us, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I know we have uh, several questions from people who are participating in the webinar, and I invite you to come up to the microphone and ask your questions as well. So um, why don't we start? I know Lisa's got some questions to share, us, uh, share with us from those on webinar. Oh, thank you. Thank Hello you, to everybody in webinar. I didn't know there was a there was a satellite campus. Pardon me. Um, I do have a que two questions from the webinar. Um, the first being, do do SGLT2 inhibitors cause the DKA or just mask the usual signs? 
i.e. elevated glucose in patients that would have got DKA anyways? So that's a great question. Um, I think I'd, I'm not going to repeat it because I think everyone heard it thanks to microphones, but um, no, they actually physiologically promote the production of free fatty acid and ketones. So the, you know, the, in patients with type 1 diabetes, the concern has been that, and which is why they're not marketed or approved for patients with type 1 diabetes, is obviously with insulin deficiency, there is a, um, with lowering the insulin dose, there's an even greater risk. But in type, 1, uh, type 2 diabetes, because of the lack of clearance of ketones, increased free fatty acids, and changes in glucagon production, it's actually um, causative rather than just masking. And again, this term euglycemic DKA is probably a misnomer because the glucose is elevated. It's just not 35. It's 15. Um, so it's lower than you would expect for the degree of acidosis and hypokalemia. Thank you. There's just one more question for the webinar. So if the audience does have questions, there's another mic over here. Or if you put your hand up, I'll bring this mic to you after this question. Um, so the second question is, does diagnosis of prediabetes require confirmatory testing with 75 grams OGTT, or is A1C 6 to 6.5% 6 sufficient based on, um, sorry, I believe that's the end of the question. Yeah, that's fantastic. So um, some of the best tools around diabetes management are on the Diabetes Canada website, and they can, where you actually can input the numbers and it can tell you what else is required. So for the diagnosis of diabetes, you need to have two different modalities. So an A1C plus uh, elevated fasting or plus a um, uh, two-hour post 75-gram OGTT. And and it has to be a different modality. For pre-diabetes, uh, the, the diagnosis, again, ideally is with two modalities, but the, the criteria are less strict, so you don't need to have the two separate modalities. Uh, I think the pre-diabetes flag is the warning sign, get you to diabetes. It's not so much about confirming because um, it's the warning sign to try to get them into the normal range. Uh, warning sign to get them to the diabetes education program, uh, more aggressive lifestyle changes, and then consideration of metformin. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And um, as I was listening to the presentation uh, myself, I think I got a little bit um, frightened with the warnings over DKA myself, and it brought to mind a, a patient I had seen last week, so I have a question for you myself. Um, and I, I know everybody here has met the same person, 65-year-old, uh, and yes, he really is a truck driver, um, and A1C of 8.5 on metformin, on uh, glycoside, um, you know, poor diet, and so the next thought was to um, start um, well, now it'll be um, empaglyphism. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, my question to you is, um, how concerned should I be about putting him into uh, DKA? And the other part of this is he's also a heavy drinker, so I'm not convinced I can keep him well hydrated. How many have met him? <laughs> wow, a lot of truck drivers. No, the, um, the so, the reason I brought up that resident that I was working with in Ethiopia is it was uncontrolled hyperglycemia. I think probably an A1C of 8.5 is not so uncontrolled that you've got a shutdown in endogenous insulin and glucose tox glucotoxicity and, and a shutdown of endogenous glucose, uh, endogenous insulin production. So the, I think that it comes to a discussion of risks and benefits as usual. You know, I'm not trying to be evasive with your question. How would, how would any of you deal with that? Do you think that's a safe um, start for someone who uh, might not? So it's not that if they get dehydrated, it's if you're not 
able to hold down food or fluids or if you've got a febrile illness because that's in a sense dehydrating but what do people think yes what do you th what do you think you're accomplishing in the overall setting here of a patient who's totally non-compliant with adding in another drug mm -hmm. <laughs> So that's where we started the presentation on, does glucose lowering impact microvascular disease and macrovascular disease? And, you know, are we making a difference by bringing his A1C? So if he's at 8.3, there's a good chance that with the SGLT2 inhibitors, we'll bring him to less than 7. So, and will that reduction reduce his microvascular risk by 40%, and is that a good thing? So. I would suggest that yes, especially if you're doing primary prevention, so he hasn't yet developed cardiovascular disease or um, microvascular disease. I think that it is worthwhile trying to lower the glucose. Um, I think there's probably some bigger picture factors that as family doctors um, you deal with all the time and about behavior change and about lifestyle changes and about adherence. But I think that it would generally uh, I think you're phenomenologically you've got an important question but I think practically it's worth trying um, and maybe a little bit of weight loss might encourage him um, with the SGLT2 inhibitors to you know have that eureka moment how many of you had patients follow that juicing craze based on a truck driver do you all know what I'm talking about there was this uh truck driver that was like 700 pounds and he went on this juiced fast and he wrote this book and he was featured on all of these TV shows and then everybody bought juicers and okay maybe just my patients were watching that show but anyway so there's always hope um, but I think that I don't want to make you terrified of these medications but I think you do need to have a, um, a discussion with your patients about some of the risks and then ultimately um, it's about him making the decision with you. Yeah, real life is much more complicated than the studies, isn't it? Any other questions? Um, just a brief comment. Because he's um, excessive alcohol intake, wouldn't you primarily really target patient education focused on lifestyle modification, decrease the alcohol intake, and then balance it, with, as you mentioned, with the medication aspect? Like, because as we all know, the increased alcohol will obviously elevate the glucose levels and mm -hmm. contribute to fatty liver, triglycerides of A1Cs. Just a thought. But. Absolutely, which is why answer number one on all of the uh, MCQs was refer to your deck because I don't know how it is in your practices I'm sure you're extremely busy you don't have the time to deal with some of those behavior change and all of the decks have significant training around you know motivational interviewing and behavior change so uh, access that group but thank you there was another question back there. Yeah, thank when you're you. adding on when you added on basal insulin could you have added on Victosa before the basal insulin if um, money is not an issue or coverage is not an issue? If money is, absolutely. Is um, better? Well, it's, you know, if, if we look at what the pros and cons are, you've got weight augmenting versus weight decreasing. So insulin does lead to weight gain. Um, part of why it leads to weight gain is we often use it in people that are already quite um, catabolic like they've got glucosuria, they've exceeded their renal threshold, so they're pouring out glucose, and when you actually lower the glucose, they're able to maintain it. But it is an anabolic steroid, so uh, it does cause weight gain. So that's typically one of the main concerns that people have about starting insulin. And um, obviously a weight-reducing medication can be helpful. I, d I don't have that many patients where cost is not an issue, but sometimes people are willing to make that sacrifice. Hopefully, if they're willing to make that sacrifice, they're willing to make other lifestyle sacrifices. But yeah, what about the difference between starting somebody on Victoza versus Trulicity? 
just at least once a week as opposed to once a day. Yeah, so, you know, that's been the, you know, when you look at another paradigm where we've had the once weekly versus once daily versus once monthly um, was the bisphosphonates, right? So bisphosphonates started off when I was training, everything was a daily pill and, you know, they drove people crazy because they had to wait an hour and stand upright and all of that. So then it moved to weekly and they actually showed that adherence rates decreased when people went to weekly. But thankfully with bisphosphonates, you only have to take it really 60% of the time to have an impact. But um, so, you know, if they forgot one time, they could catch it the next day. But uh, when, you've, when you move people from weekly bisphosphonates to monthly, you saw bone densities drop because people, so you really have to know the kind of patient. If it's the kind of patient that everything's programmed into their phone and, you know, they've got alarms for this and that, then a once weekly is great um, because they'll remember to take it. But using the bisphosphonate model, it, less frequent dosing hasn't necessarily led to better adherence. But in a motivated person who'd rather only inject once a week, you've got a great option. It is more expensive. So again, you're talking about what's your coverage, what's your copay, um, can you, do you get it reimbursed or do you have to cover it? Because that makes a big impact. Sometimes people can't put it out, can't put $300 up front for a medication and then wait two weeks while they get it refunded through their drug plan. Okay, it looks like there's food coming in, so I'm holding you from your lunch. So <laughs> enjoy, and um, if you have any other questions or if you want to connect by email, please come and find me. Please help me to thank Dr. Wolf for her excellent presentation. On behalf of the Heart and Stroke Foundation and the Planning Committee, thank you very much, and we'd like to give you this small token of our gratitude. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, 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 no. Oh, look, it's a cab. Oh, fun. All right. Wow, it's very good. Well, thank you. Oh, that's fun. Really excellent. Well, I think my husband will. Uh,